last series, we got to walk through what it can look like to evolve and develop into the community that can be open for what is to come. Because that can be a little ethereal, that can be kind of abstract, we wanted to sit in it today to ask what would it look like to start construction? In this passage, Jeremiah is speaking in a letter to the people of Jerusalem who were forced into exile in Babylon and now must live and serve the Babylonian empire. Jeremiah writes to the displaced with a message that they may not have expected. If they had hoped that Yahweh or their nation would save them soon, this letter would have dashed those hopes. According to Jeremiah, God is not coming to bring them back to their homeland for another 70 years. That is essentially three generations worth of time. For some people, Jeremiah was giving them a death sentence in Babylon. They would never return. But in his letter, Jeremiah helps the displaced envision a hope that extends beyond their lifetime. Instead of an invitation to die in exile, Jeremiah provides an invitation to live. Jeremiah tells them to settle and create a home, to build foundations, roofs, and walls, to share their cuisine and enjoy Babylonian food, to fall in love, get married, have weddings, have sex, bear children, and raise them in the homes that they have made in this foreign land. Learn new languages, teach them to your children. Do not be hostile to these people as though they are an enemy, but care for them as neighbors. This would be the path to freedom for future generations. Now, this passage is not about us, but it has much to teach us. There are times when we feel like exiles. Many of us have been forced to leave our traditions in order to keep ourselves alive. But for some, part of the faith uh, part of the faith reconstruction process is being liberated from isolationism and bitterness, learning to build spacious and welcoming homes, learning to unlearn people as our enemies. Now, yes, there's tension. There are systems and parts of our traditions that are dehumanizing and evil. And it's not so much about learning to accept the broken, harmful ways of those traditions. It's okay to abandon those systems. But how do we abandon oppressive systems without abandoning people? Is there anything beautiful and life-giving worth not letting go of? How do we name and heal religious trauma and still give us all space to experience a hospitable faith that liberates? A common question gets asked in times of conflict in these moments of change. What would you do differently? This question asks us to imagine what would be if events didn't happen, dreaming about returning to a particular past, particular moment. This is what is happening all around Jeremiah. People are seeking a time before Babylon. They're looking backwards, imagining a world where Jerusalem's walls stand forever. Yet, Jeremiah said, all those sent into exile to Babylon from Jerusalem, build, settle, plant, marry, grow, seek new peace with the new people. Seek peace in a post-Jerusalem world. There is no going back, only going through. And that will require building room for nurturing unexpected new life. Build, settle, plant grow while seeking peace for the post-Jerusalem world. The event of exile forever changed the language of Israel. They reread their sacred stories, influenced by their shared experience, rather than controlled by a literal text or a domineering past. Reconstructing is the act of being influenced by experience so that the next home we build together expands from the new wisdom gained. 700 years later, the event has become an identity. As Peter opens his first epistle, before the exile, they were the chosen people, 
chosen for Jerusalem, the promised land and the center of power. But now they are the chosen landless foreigners of exile. We get to see that the experience of the community filtered through Jeremiah, becoming an identity in Peter, shapes the way he can imagine what this new people are gonna be because of Christ. Chosen is modified by shared experience. Divine word is nuance because of the living. Jeremiah moving through exile gave word for rereading ancient texts influenced by experience. Peter moves from Jeremiah's diaspora, rereading 20 passages in light of exile and the Christ event. In light of experience over the literal text to make room for the new life he is witnessing to. This is the sacred liminal task of reconstructing. You can never go back to the original faith, life, or structures that failed. You can only process through, allowing experience to shape how we build the next home. Jeremiah 29 has always been one of those texts which troubled me and gave me hope simultaneously. Troubled me because it is asking the readers to trust that there is a future while learning to inhabit the space they currently are. Not just inhabit, but to build a life, to reconstruct their faith, family, and future in the void of dislocation, disruption, and, di and destruction. The author is asking the reader to have enough trust that God is still at work to do that. The dissonance for me is that I want to trust. I want to have that kind of hope. I want to be able to place my faith in a God that is calling us to build lives of prosperous peace in the midst of desolation. In a past message earlier in this series, Megan gave us a metaphor of building a house that our faith could inhabit, but she also gave us an exhortation to build a house with the future generations in mind. In Jeremiah 29, the people of Judah are called to build a life for themselves, their children, and their children's children. It takes a lot of faith to build that kind of a home, one where we plant goodness and mercy, one where we live lives of gracious hospitality, one where we pray for and seek the peace of not just our community, but all of those who inhabit the city. And as an analog, I take the city to be the place where exiles, wanderers, and citizens, so to speak, come together in mutual prosperity and peace. So you have just heard um, a different perspective from uh, myself, uh, Glenn, and Carl, where we look at the beginning passage in uh, Jeremiah 29. Um, and before we go into our question, we wanted to just take a moment to reflect on what we each have shared. Um, so uh, in tradition of what we do in folks, we wanted to give ourselves a second to share if there was anything that stood out to us from what we all shared. If there are any points of curiosity, clarity, confusion, or conviction that emerged as we walk through those pieces together, I, I really like the fact that, like both of you, um, in in what you said, painted a very clear picture of like humanness. It was like like in the language that you used, in the language that you chose to to bring forth, um, in re-inhabiting their faith, re-inhabiting the space, living into the city, you know, building a life. Like you guys just gave very much, like very clear human language for what does that look like? What does it actually mean? What does it actually like? Like how do how do we actually begin to do that? And I think for for myself, it was really helpful to then begin to imagine myself in in my own journey. Okay, what does that look like for me to actually then basically be more human? And that's actually what it means to live into our faith is to learn how to be more human. Yeah. I would go along the lines of that because uh, actually all of us used language of inhabiting, of inclusion. Um, one of the lines that you put out, Megan, which I think was a moment of conviction for me, because often in these points of reconstruction, we can wholeheartedly um, be seeking peace, but we let go of everyone that brought us to this point. We can no longer accept wisdom from old traditions. We can no longer hear other people's. And so your line of how do we abandon oppressive systems without abandoning people? It's probably one of the um, stronger challenges to say, uh, whatever this is, kind of like uh, Carl's moment of, 
saying that this city is the place of the is the a locative place for the displaced and exiled. That what does it look like to understand ourselves in this locative place, saying that we have to create the home we're all going to live into. In doing that, though, we can't build it in spite of the others that came. We have to build it with from the shared wisdom, from the shared moments. I think that's such a harder way to try to move forward. I think uh, I I concur with uh, what Carl was just saying about this idea of the question of what it means to be human um, and what it means to be more human um, and how do we do that is, I think it's really cool that that goes right alongside this question of how, how do we reconstruct our faith? Um, how do we take apart the things that have dehumanized us and dehumanized our communities? Um, even, even sometimes dehumanizing the, the people and places we come from that we see as our, our enemy. Um, it's about learning to rehumanize all of us. Um, for Glenn's uh, piece, I really appreciated um, the comments on the importance of needing to go through the experience and that um, the way forward is by going through, not by paying attention um, and allowing the past to domineer. Um, and I think as I've moved forward from some traditions in my faith reconstruction process, um, I think a piece that has really helped uh, me sort of move forward is that idea of experience being sacred. So as we move forward, our experience becomes our teacher, um, not just the text. And I think that was uh, really great. Um, and for Carl, I uh, appreciated your line of saying that um, there was, there's a piece of dissonance of both wanting to trust, and then of course, the reality of not being able to sometimes. Um, and in terms of thinking of like just for the people in this passage in Jeremiah, um, the hope really is for future generations. Uh, it's not something that we're going to experience in the same way that future generations will, but our actions um, are directly linked to what they will experience. So I was just, a question I had from that is like, how do we, how do we experience and participate in, in trust when we know that a lot of these realities are something that come later, come two to three generations sometimes later. Um, and what does trust look like um, in that space? Yeah. I, I think that that's, that's an interesting call for, I think for us, like that notion that we need to have a long view of history that, um, that we need patience in the midst of that. But the but, uh, reason, I, reason I, want to, I, want, I, said I want to actually have a follow-up question is like, but what do we do with that part of like that notion of a long view of history that doesn't, from a place of privilege, doesn't tell the underprivileged or the oppressed that you just need to wait? I was, I was thinking just from a person I just heard speak said that uh, we've heard too long that people need to be good children to their parents when what we need to raise people to do is become good ancestors for the next generation. And I think um, in, in that known, uh, pulling from trying to become good ancestors, that we would look at the long view of history is needed so we don't become hopeless in the daunting task of trying to bend the arc of history towards justice. But saying I'm gonna be a good ancestor means I have to act now in whatever limited way I have, um, whatever short-sightedness I have, I can't allow um, the inability for perfection to stop me from saying, but I can start making moves. That's a really difficult question. Um, I think there's very much the reality of like justice delayed being justice denied. Um, and that there, there are real windows for justice to happen and that the longer those windows um, are um, the the more that it speaks to the oppressed community of, of, of their value and their worth and um, just there is a connection of justice to swiftness um, and how long things take and it's important to to hold on to that as you're holding on to there are things that we are building for future generations to come. Um, 
And I really like what you shared, Glenn, um, inspired by whoever you heard speak. I think that I, I've never considered that reality of like, okay, we have our ancestors, but we are also future ancestors um, for the communities to come. Um, so I think definitely it's a mixture of making sure we have a holistic view of, okay, how do we hold the past without letting it domineer us and trap us? How do we not forget the future um, and know that we are connected to all of these things? Um, and how do we make uh, justice real for the people who are alive now. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't have a, a perfect answer for that question, but I know that it comes from one, getting rid of uh, harmful individualistic mindsets. I think we're, we're, we're not connected to our communities. We're not connected to communities from the past and the future. I think the more that we just focus on ourselves and what we need instead of focusing on the very communal realities that shape all of us and recognizing that everything we do affects the people around us and affects those to come. I know that it's, it's somewhere through that passage that we can find some answer to that question. One of, one of my favorite philosophers, theologians, uh, John D. Caputo has this one quote that was from his, his memoir, his, his autobiography, where it said like, you have to learn how to own your tradition so that your traditions don't, so that your traditions no longer own you. And for him, that was, that was a statement about him learning how to re-inhabit his own faith, right? How to, like, he comes from a Catholic tradition and what did it mean for him to become Catholic instead of having to jettison the tradition, how to, having to let go of the tradition. And so I just wanted to ask that question in, in light, in light of that, like, how do we, um, come to that place where we can learn how to own our traditions so that our traditions no longer own us? I think for me, um, a large part of this was having to own up to the fact that a lot of the ways I was processing the tradition and that I came from, um, and then there's, there's real trauma, there's real hurt, there's real pain. There's, there's things that um, we can, I can give grace to myself for, but um, I think as I was processing those things, I realized that I was dehumanizing a lot of the people that were involved in the traditions I came from. Um, they just became these villains in my mind that everything was premeditated, um, that they uh, knew what they were doing at all the times that they were hurting me and that they themselves didn't come from harmful traditions that shape them. Um, so I think a large part of owning my tradition was that aspect of rehumanizing um, the people that uh, I, I knew from those places, um, seeing them as people who have the same desires and dreams and hopes as me in many ways. Um, and I think that that helped me learn to see the, the pieces that are still worth holding on to that my heart still wanted to hold on to that I wasn't letting myself because it just, it came from that place I deemed as the bad place. Um, so yeah, that would be my, my first response to that question. Um, for me, it went a little differently rather than rehumanizing, which um, honestly, part of letting go of my tradition to be able to reclaim the tradition did have that effect of, of not only humanizing myself, but the other people I saw but also claiming my tradition as a tradition, um, taking away the absolute nature of it. Like the three of us were talking the other day with the whole um, book club idea. And we, we had Will make a comment because, oh, when I came to this 18 years ago, it was, this is just the way it is. It's absolute. Um, and he can recognize now how he got to the place of the tradition he's in. But when he first came into it, and I was the same way, when I first went to Bible college, I thought I was learning the way of the tradition that would be able to illuminate and enlighten all around. And then to discover how much that the entire history is a creative process of recreating, rebuilding, uh, reimagining to say what is the best living, loving response to those in front of me, help me to own my tradition because like, okay, this isn't a massive overlord. They didn't have all insights. Like for the book of Jeremiah, Jeremiah is not the um, 
narrator's view that knows everything. It is one person dealing with a particular tragedy for the, those he loves in a city that he loves being sent into exile due to violence, war, and atrocities. Like these are real people with real events. So to take away the absolute nature of it allowed me to sit in and say, okay, I have a job to recreate now. For me, I, I look at it as an ongoing process, right? Like I, every day I feel like I have to wake up and say, okay, I'm going to live into this tradition today. Um, but kind of like what Glenn was saying, like coming to that place, realizing it was a tradition, um, allow me to, I think, to do that. Because if, if it's a tradition, then I can choose it as my tradition. If it's the absolute, it just is. And I don't have a choice. I have to either fight against it or go with the flow. And for me, learning how to actually value other traditions that are outside of my own then taught me to come back around and value my own tradition in, 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 in a similar way. And so for me, like growing up as a, you know, within the four square denomination, Pentecostal, um, there was lots of things about that experience that made me want to throw it all away. But there was also some really beautiful parts of that, that as, I, as I've matured as a person, as a human being, it's like these things actually helped me to be a better human being, right? Helped me to be a better person. And so for me, owning my tradition is tapping into those into the into those pieces the parts that actually allow me to be more human allow me to to be more present with people allow me to to be a kinder more loving christ follower um and that's the part where only my tradition is saying okay like i have a i have a cho i have a choice to make and i can choose to do that versus um saying this is just something i either have to fight against or go with one or the other and i have to take all of it or none of it kind of vibes so so, um, with that, let's just, I'll just jump to the second part of the question. Like, how do we sift through and sort out that which is good and beautiful while leaving behind and jettisoning that which has been harmful and hurtful? I think all of us had um, one central thing going through our experience, um, our readings of Jeremiah, is we're bringing in the interplay of our own experience to give new meanings. And for one of these, I think it, we have to start asking the question of, where and when does experience get a privileged position in our reading of text, our reading of social systems, ideas of oppression, that we can say, okay, these are harmful because we only gain that through the experience. And as um, one Old Testament scholar said, that that's the gift of the other. When Israel goes into exile, into Babylon, they actually create a stronger concept of the concept of self there because it's only in experiencing the other that you can start naming yourself. But it's in this experience of the person that we can see where abuse is, but that's also me putting trust in you guys. When you name abuse, it's not for me to um, always put a litmus test to it, but to be able to say, can I trust that the people telling me about abuse can name the realities? Because um, that helps shape and widen my own experience. Um, I, I think for me is like just going, returning to the, the metaphor of like, um, rebuilding right that like building a house or a home and even beginning to look at like even that language that we use um the idea of home versus house right like a home is where the people are a house is just a piece of property um and and I, and I find it interesting that in this passage um like they're called to build they're called to build homes they're called to build a life they're called to inhabit that space and for me that's a valuing of of the people and the presence with those people over lo any locative um, like kind of property idea. And so for me in, in trying to let go of that, which was hurtful and harmful is, is, is all like all the things that are like the constructive materials. If it, if it wasn't, if it wasn't helpful, then I need to learn how to let that go. Um, but as far as people go, I need to learn how to reconcile. I need to learn how to um, ask for forgiveness and then offer forgiveness as well in the places where I've, I've found harm and I found hurt and I need to call people to accountability. I need to allow myself to be called to accountability in those places, right? So for me, the letting go process in that, um, of, of that which was harmful and hurtful is letting go of all, all the, the things that I would like to construct in order to kind of create defensive space for myself, right? like for me personally. Um, and then saying that, that I value the people over being able to hold and protect my own my own like property if that makes sense right like that these aspects of my faith um 
whether I agree or disagree with different parts of the faith and what other people are holding on to, I value them over trying to control the narrative and control those pieces, if that makes sense. I like how you unpack the analogy a little bit more. Uh, just because um, I, about a year ago, I was working on, on a house with my father and we treat traditions this way. If we have to keep them all, if we absolutize them. And we found that one part of the building they cut trees down rather than make a foundation and built on it. So suddenly it was discovered the reason why the foundation was failing is because they're rotten trees filled with carpenter ants and um, termites. Now, if, if we absolutize these systems, then when we repaired it, we'd have to put those things back. It's tradition, this is what we inherited, it has to be. But for you to name that, it's like, well, no, part of wisdom, part of experience, part of the community, is sorting through what is harmful, what parts have those things that if you build upon this, your next house is gonna crumble just as fast, maybe even faster because some of those um, broken systems are so inherent to it already that it doesn't need the time to build up. I think it's a beautiful way to explain it. Um, as you were talking, I was just thinking about this idea that you know every, every tradition wasn't a tradition at some point, that traditions aren't this eternal thing that exists outside of time and space. They're very much connected to the particular particularities of our human experience. And every tradition started as a new idea. Um, every tradition started somewhere and there was a time where the tradition didn't exist, but then meaning was created through experience. Um, and these traditions uh, continue through time because they continue to hold meaning for a certain community. Um, but that idea of traditions not being static and they're meant to start and shift. Um, the very idea of tradition comes from like thinking about it conceptually. It would, it, it, it's where meaning shifted somewhere. Um, mean, something that was mundane became sacred. Um, so it's, it's meant to be something that's transitory, that shifts, um, and that is created through our experiences. And I think when we, we forget that it's something that needs to be continually created by our experience, that's when it moves into harmful and hurtful um, places. Um, but when it becomes something that's connected to the generative work in our communities and um, the generative work the traditions give to us, then we can sort of tap into um, that part of it that is beautiful and life-giving. Um, and I think in, in just a very practical, probably less conceptually described um, thing, uh, I think part of sorting out what is good and beautiful is, is just looking at what, what gives us life and what doesn't. Um, and actually taking time to, to see how communities um, are affected by our traditions, how we as individuals to our community, to outside that, um, what were, I, it's like if I was speaking from the tradition years ago, I'd say, where's the fruit? Like what, where, where are the fruit of these traditions? Do they move us towards people? Do they help people experience humanity in its fullness, life in its fullness? Um, do they give us a bigger sense of uh, human dignity. Um, but with, with that, uh, man, uh, this has been such a, a rich conversation and I'm looking forward to actually seeing how the conversation continues to play out within our community as we actually begin to discuss what does it look like for us to inhabit the home together, but also inhabit a home in such a way that future generations will always have a home, hmm. right? And so uh, just uh, I, I, based off of what Glenn um, said in one of his responses about um, learning how to be ancestors. Uh, I, I just kind of had a benediction um, thought that came to mind. So I, I will close this with that. And if it sucks, I'll erase it. That's, that's how it works. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, may we learn to love our ancestors. May we learn to become ancestors. And may we learn to inhabit as specters of blessing the homes that we are building now. Mm -hmm.